I am an applied mathematician. I love working with other people and doing collaborative work in the sciences outside of mathematics. Because I think math can be applied to a lot of stuff. And often we need the expertise to do it. And I, I would love to supply that expertise. So one question that's been in the news, it's perhaps been eclipsed more recently about concerns with global warming, is the question of overpopulation. Has anybody here ever thought about the question? Do you think that there is, is a, does anybody here think that overpopulation is a problem or could be a problem? I see some people saying yes. Does anybody think there's no way there absolutely could not be a problem or don't know? So let me say that I was definitely on the don't know side and I would say that Slate Magazine and the New York Times opinion pages are also on the side that no, overpopulation is not a problem. Well, one way we can go about trying to answer this question is by trying to apply some math to the situation. So, I do mathematical models. A mathematical model is simply a description of a system using mathematical concepts and language. Now, if you don't like math, that might scare you a little bit, but don't let it. That's why you keep me around, after all. <laughs> So I'm going to take a look at two models for population. The first is what's called the exponential growth model. Now that's an equation, so if you don't like math, that might, be, that might be scaring you a little bit, but it shouldn't. This equation, this part of the equation says the change in population with respect to time is equal to some constant times the current population. So in other words, the number of new human beings we get is proportional to the number that we have. And that should make sense to you, right? And that, 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 that's not a bad model. That, that's not a bad starting premise for this. That we've got, you know, that, that, that things grow in proportion to how many people that we have. Well, this can be as a differential equation. Don't worry about how you solve it. It is solved by a curve of this form, and we can graph that curve, and an exponential growth curve looks like that. If you want to get models of population, if you want a slightly fancier for model for population, you might look at what's called the logistic growth curve. That says that the change or increase in population is nearly proportional to the current population when the population is small, but the change decreases as the population gets close to carrying capacity. That's this equation. Notice that the only change is this term right here. So when P is very small, P over L, L is usually a very big, that's called the limiting population. If L is big and P is small, this piece is close to zero. So then we've got just this part of it, that's exponential growth like before, and that's what we see down here. But then when P gets close to L, this term becomes close to one, so that becomes zero. So that says that our change goes to zero. So this logistic curve, it starts like exponential growth, and then it levels off. This is also commonly used for population. So one question we can ask with the world population is, does it look more like the exponential growth curve, or does it look more like the logistic growth curve? Let's take a look at that. <laughs> world population looks like. We obviously have better, more accurate data in this part of the curve than we have down here. Notice that this goes back negative 10,000 years. That's a long time ago. We weren't around to count people up back then, so we have to use other methods to estimate how many people that there existed. Even so, I take one look at that data and let me say that there is a feeling of cold dread in my heart. <laughs> because what does this look like? That looks like exponential growth. And exponential growth keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and that is a really scary thought. But remember, logistic at its beginning looks like exponential growth too, so maybe it's not that bad. So what I went in and did is I did what's called a curve fit, a least squares nonlinear curve fit to this data. So in red you see my logistic curve, which does a little bit better with these data points in here. And in blue you see my exponential curve. Now my logistic curve quits out right about there. Exponential actually went up to that top data point at whatever time I quit modeling out at. 
There's one more thing that's up here. There are these funny R2s. Those are R squared values. R squared values tell me how good the fit is. And you want these to be close to 1. Well, exponential is as close to 1 as you can get it. <laughs> right? It's, it's not quite 1, but it is really close. Now, logistic, let me say, we can't really rule this out because that is also really close to 1. So we have no reason just from looking at to say, hey, logistic is definitely wrong, exponential is definitely better. It certainly is closer, but this is not enough evidence. But there's one more thing that the logistic model gives me, which is that it gives me this carrying capacity, which is if this model is true, so if I use it to model, if this model is correct, how many people do I have when the population levels out? And this says I have 10 to the 12th people. So we have how many billion? We have about 7 billion people on the planet right now. Who knows what number? Exponent, no, exponent number is associated to billion. That's 10 to the 9th. 10 to the 12th is a thousand times, is three factors of 10, so that's a thousand times bigger. So that means for every one of you, for every one of you, for every one of you, for every one of those two people, we have a thousand new people around. Wait a minute. A lot of people. Well, you can do a little bit more mathematics with this. This is not mathematical modeling per se. It's more of the form of, you know, just trying to figure some things out. So if this is correct, we could run out of water in space. So if exponential fit is correct, we end up with one meter squared of dry land per person in the year 3620. And if you're wondering what a meter squared looks like, this is a meter cubed. <laughs> okay, 3620, that's a long way away. You and I don't need to worry about this, right? We're not going to be around in 3620. But remember the time scale that we looked at for that population data? It went back to negative 10,000. Compared to, and we're in the year 2000, so negative 10,000, that's 12,000 years ago. This is barely more than a thousand years in the future. So over the course of the time that humans have been on the earth, this is coming up fast. Now if logistic is true, we end up with 124.8 meters squared per person at the limiting population. Okay, that's a bigger plot. It's, you know, maybe, I, I forget, I, I'm not the best at it doing in-my-head calculations, but I think that might be a piece of land about as big as this room. That's not, it's on that order of magnitude. Remember that from that piece of land, you have to get everything that you eat, everything that you need to live, your clothing, your shelter, etc. Okay, of course, we can solve some problems by building people up into gigantic skyscrapers. But let me say, this is a terrifying number. That is not much to get, that is not much to live off of. And let me say the water situation is scary, too. If we look at planet Earth, all of Earth's water, including its oceans, is represented by this sphere. And the amount of fresh water that we have for the Earth is in this sphere, and the amount of fresh water in lakes and rivers is so small that you can't even see it on there. Okay, so, so, that scares me. This also scares me, although I do strongly recommend that you go look up Stuart McMillian and his comics, and this one in particular. So, this is a story about some reindeer. During the Second World War, this is off the coast of Alaska, there is an island called St. Matthew's Island. And we put a long-distance sensing station on this island. And consequently, they made, they made a sensing station. They also imported some reindeer because people had to man the sensing station and people might need something to eat. And just in case, reindeer are food. We'll put them on there. So in 1944, 29 reindeer were put on this island. Now this island was a great habitat for reindeer because it was covered with their favorite food source, which was lichen. So the reindeer, unsurprisingly, 
grew rather rapidly. Now, we decommissioned that station, and humans really didn't visit again until 1957. In 1957, there were 1,350 reindeer on St. Matthew's Island. And they were fat and healthy, and they were doing really, really well. Well, the humans went away again and didn't return to St. Matthew's Island until 1963. In 1963, there were 6,000 reindeer on the island. And at this point, the reindeer were not quite so fat and happy. They were looking a little scraggly and a little bit thin. Came back in 1966, there were 42 reindeer on the island. 41 of them were female. One was an infertile male. In the mid-1980s, reindeer were extinct on St. Matthew's Island. Here is a graph that shows the growth in population for the reindeer and its very sudden crash. So this island provided food in abundance for the reindeer, which was the source of their prosperity. It was also the source of their undoing, right? Because they grew so quickly that they couldn't sustain it. May I note that unless we start giving NASA a whole lot more money and seeing some great developments in the space program, we also live on an island, which is the source of our prosperity. Let us hope it is not also the source of our undoing. So, if you're not a mathematician, you should be a little bit skeptical. What does this mean? Why does it matter? Why do we know that it works? When I'm going to curve fit data, I wanted to just say a little bit about how I do it. What I look at is these are data points, and this is the curve that I'm trying to fit. I look at the distance, the vertical distance, between that point and the curve. I square it, which means I multiply it by itself, because of course that distance could also be negative. So in squaring it, I make all of these differences positive. Since they're all positive, I know there has to be a smallest, value for the parameters of this curve that will get me as close to this to all of these data points as possible. So that's how I'm looking to solve this type of math problem. Okay, what curve best fits with what curve of this particular shape best fits the data? That's how that's that that is done. So before we get all sad about the imminent demise of the human population, let's remember something. First of all, human beings are not reindeer, are we? How do we differ from reindeer? We have thumbs. We have thumbs. <laughs> Can you name another important aspect relevant to this problem in which we differ from reindeer? We're <laughs> so, so, so let me say human beings have one important thing that is different from reindeer. We have this wonderful invention called birth control. And we can all thank Margaret Sanger for that, because she's the woman who pushed for the invention of the birth control pill, which is perhaps the most important invention of the 21st century, in my humble opinion. So we have some control over how we reproduce. Another truth about human population is this is one of my favorite sentences that's in the mathematical world. The future depends on the past only through the present. So one fault you can raise for me in all of the data that I've just shown you in all of the curve fitting is that I was looking way into the past for information about the future. But if your grandparents were sick, or if they were impoverished, or if they only had, you know, if they had five children instead of six, that's not at all going to influence the next generation, right? The only thing that matters is who's here now and what we're doing now. So the future depends on the past only through the present. And let me say that demographers who actually do predict what our population is going to be, they do that from estimates of current birth and death rates in the world. So they are not looking at curves like I looked at. They are looking at what is happening right here, right now, with the best data that they can get. So don't despair. The future is not set in stone. We can still change it. So I hope that that gave you some insight into how mathematical models can help inform us about a problem like overpopulation. Now let's look at something more fun.
What would happen if all of a sudden a zombie walked into the Central Washington University Biology Seminar, Natural Sciences Seminar on Friday? Would the humans be able to survive? What should we do in order to survive? Is there anything you can do right now to protect yourself in the event that this awful capitalism should come to pass? Or are we in trouble? So, this is a population model based on a concept from the epidemiology model. So epidemiology is a fancy word for disease. Um, it's based on the susceptible infected recovered models. These are called SIR models from disease modeling. So there was an original paper, um, Munz et al., and it was called When Zombies Attack, Mathematical Modeling of an Outbreak of Zombie Infection. Now, I think that I saw this first while I was teaching differential equations. I don't think I was teaching differential equations, although I had, and a friend of mine was, so I emailed it to my friend. Then the next year, I was assigned to teach a mathematical modeling course. Okay, no big deal, right? Except that the reason I was assigned to teach it was that of the tenured faculty, they had all said, I am never teaching this course again. <laughs> Give it to somebody else. And so the person who was in charge of scheduling looked around and said, you, you're it. So most of that summer, let me say, I had pretty much a three-month-long anxiety attack about this class. Three months, nonstop, until Connie, the friend that I had sent this paper to, sent it back to me. And at that point, I sat back and said, you know what? I'm going to be able to justify a day, if not a week, maybe even longer than a week, talking to math students about zombies. There's going to be at least one day of awesome in this class. I think I can handle that. So these guys started with this model. So ignore the equations. If you don't like equations, just look at the boxes. So what's happening here, these are our susceptibles or our normal humans. What would this group be? And this is the removed class. You can think these are the dead bodies. So you can become removed with the disease. If you've had the measles, then you're not going to get it again. You're immune to getting the measles again. So that would remove you. Now you can also, in another type of disease, of course, if you die, again, you're removed. You're not going to catch it again if you're dead, right? But you're safe. So what's happening with this? So these arrows tell you how things transfer between these three boxes. So right here, this is a birth rate for the humans. These are humans being born. Then how is it that humans become zombies? You guys have all seen zombie movies. They bite you, right? And then you're infected and you become a zombie. Well, in order for that to happen, a human, an S, and then Z, which is a zombie, have to interact. And then that B is a constant of proportionality, which says a certain number of times when this happens, humans are going to end up becoming zombies. Now, I got good news for you. What's the other thing that can happen when a human and a zombie interact? Yes, we can hatchet that zombie and put it into the removed class. <laughs> Out of there, zombie, which is awesome. Now, the other thing that can happen with humans, of course, is that we can die of natural and not quite natural causes, right? We die of disease, we get hit by cars. So that's that term. But then there's a problem. How do zombies come into the world in the first place? Well, there is, of course, the legend from, from, from the voodoo that evil human sorcerers called bokors cast spells that cause zombies to be raised from the dead. So here we've got our dead bodies, and here's the term. The zombies are getting raised from the dead. It certainly isn't all the dead. This is some proportion of them are coming up and becoming zombies again. And then that's represented by these equations. So remember, that just means the change in humans with respect to time are the humans born, minus the humans that become zombies, minus those who die of natural causes. The change in zombies with time are the proportion of zombies who successfully bite humans and turn them into zombies, minus those who get by the humans, plus those who are risen from, who, that rise from the dead. And the change in dead bodies with respect to time, well, when humans kill a zombie, when humans get killed by other means, 
and of course, when some, and, and then we subtract off the zombies that come out of there. So what happens when you actually put some, you've got to put values in for these constants. What actually is going to happen? So in that scenario, there are really two different cases that we can look at. The zombies can be better fighters than humans, or the humans can be better fighters than zombies. And that has to do with those two constants that multiply the S times the Z term. So if the zombies are more effective, it turns out that we get wiped out generally pretty darn quickly. That's not good. Now if the humans are more effective, well, let's look, that blue curve is us, that's us, right? <laughs> What's that? It's going down to zero, right? So this model is truly bad news for humans. Um, it says that no matter what happens, it doesn't matter who's a better fighter than whom. We're all zombie food in the end. <laughs> Which is a sad state of affairs. That said, I really think there are some things that we could criticize about this model. What do you think is wrong with it? The human zombie encounter should go down as, as both populations decrease. Well, I think that it will because it is multiplied by the number of humans and the number of zombies. So this number, so as S gets smaller and Z gets smaller, S times Z surely gets smaller in both of these. Humans don't seem to give birth to new humans. So there is that. So, so there is a birth rate here, but it is a strange birth rate, I would say, for this. It's not proportional to the current population. It's it's a constant birth rate. But I think there's there's worse. I mean, what is a zombie? Is it that term doesn't make sense. Sorry, what's that? That term doesn't really make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? Um, just. That's assuming that zombies would continuously rise from the dead. And so you do not believe in evil sorcerers that are successfully able to raise things. That's good. I don't believe in that either. I completely agree. This, 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 this is horse pucky. This is compost. This is no good. Also, what about the change in the E term over time? Change in this term? Yeah, over time to generalize like the adaptability of humans. So you could argue that these should not be a constant, that that should change with time, because humans should get better and better at fighting zombies, right? Or uh, at least, and, yes? Don't humans have weapons that would make them more effective at fighting zombies? <laughs> that might be true, but couldn't zombies get a hold of those same weapons and come after us with them? <laughs> but I agree, it might be, that might be a, just a great argument that humans are more effective fighters. What other ideas do you have? Um, does that take into account that what if you have some kind of immunity? That somebody has immunity to the zombie bite. So it might be that somebody is immune to the zombie bite, and that's not taken care of in here at all. In the back. Would your FR term be relative to the population of humans? No, because these are zombies rising from the dead, so no, that's got to be. FR was right. Sorry. The rate at which it happens, because if the people rising the zombies are humans population of yeah. So this should depend on the number of sorcerers that are out there doing this. And we don't have anything with sorcerers on there, so that's another another criticism. What else have we got? Yeah, you go from human to, to, to zombie, it, uh, it's basically one way, and zombie could re recover. And so, you just look at the model. Uh, of course, zombie will not die out, because there is a rate of recovery. Change. Yeah, so this, 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 this term here really is unfair. That's right. It's really That's super right. unfair. That is really, really unfair. We have an idea right there. Well, so does this model take into account that every human is turning into a zombie after they die? So no, not necessarily. So some of these, so, so if a human it has to interact with the zombie in order to turn into a zombie, and even if when they interact, sometimes that human turns into a zombie, and sometimes that human takes a zombie and turns the zombie into a corpse. So I would, I have one more idea in the back. Well, if zombies are just walking corpses, they would be Yes, 
That's the one I wanted to hear. Absolutely. Why is it that zombies are not dying off from their own natural causes, which is decomposition? So you guys have had some great ideas here. And what I ask my students to do is to come up with ideas like that. But then you don't just have to come up with those ideas. You have to figure out how to turn them into mathematics. And what you want to do, remember, we are not on the sides of the side of the zombies here. We want the humans to win. So please, find us some models and some situations in which humans survive. So let's look at the simplest possibility that my students usually come up with which is very simply to say that, hey, we're going to look at zombieism as being more of a disease than as it's being the supernatural thing. So that really, truly, grossly unfair term of zombies rising from the dead, we're just going to knock that out of the model. Now, I have left a little bit of supernatural in here, in that if you're a zombie, the only way you get killed is if you can only be killed by a human. So I have not taken decomposition into effect here. But decomposition can only help us, right? And I've made this birth rate a little bit more reasonable. It's now proportional to the human population, which it should be. But this is similar to before. The big thing that was removed was that unfair term right there. So what happens when I try this model? So, in the first plot, the zombies are the more effective fighters, and I'm sorry, but that's still a sad model because you can see that the humans are going away with time. But in the second model, I made humans better fighters than the zombies. And this is good news because as soon as a zombie shows up, we cut off its head. And then it's gone, and it's not a problem anymore. So if we're better fighters than them, we're in good shape. So my students have looked at many, many models. I'm not going to show them all to you here, because I want to talk a little bit about evolution before I'm done. And let me say, I have been surprised every time I've taught this. Just some student who is not the most brilliant student in the class will come up with an idea that I had never even in any way thought that they would come up with before and does some beautiful mathematics with it. So, did I see a question? Um, is this taking into account that zombies are always killed by humans, or that they kill humans some of the time? When, when you say humans are more effective? So this says, so in this case, humans are better fighters than zombies are. In this case, zombies are better fighters than humans are. In both cases, we're using this model right here. So if the zombie is a better fighter, then this beta is going to be bigger than alpha. So a human has a greater probability of becoming a zombie when they get together and they fight than the zombie does of being dead. Now, if the human is the better fighter, then we have more probability that the zombie will become dead than that the human will become the zombie. Does that help explain it? So it's not 100% that the human will always kill the zombie, but no. it's just more probable? No, it's just more probable. And it's not, in fact, in every interaction doesn't necessarily result with either of those things happening either. So sometimes it'll just happen, they'll kind of scuffle, and then everybody will you know, turn around and, and, and run. <laughs> So, my students have decided, and, and I have decided overseeing all of their models, tips for survival. If we're going to do anything, if we're going to pull the, the military in, do it quickly and do it with major force. Quickly, get rid of the zombies. Two, we need to arm the populace. Everyone should be walking around with weapons. We need to have weapons trainings back into our elementary schools to make sure that our children know how to take care of themselves in case of the zombie apocalypse. And if we are lucky enough to have the case where zombies decay, yes, you probably can protect yourself and your loved ones by making a secure, well-defended, well-stocked hideaway. That way, even if the zombies manage to eat every other human on the planet, if you can just outlast their decomposition time, then eventually you can emerge back into the world and repopulate the human race. Okay. So... On 
downward to phytoplankton. So phytoplankton, <laughs> I know, what a downer after the zombies. <laughs> But these guys are important too. So the word, so here's where you're going to learn something today. I gave you a treat, now you've got to learn something. So phytoplankton, that means plant wanderer. These are photosynthesizing organisms, they live in, in water. They're agents of primary production, which means that sunlight shines on them, they sequester carbon dioxide and they make energy out of that. They depend on minerals, primarily nitrogen, phosphorus, and silica. By the way, those are very similar to the way regular terrestrial things, regular terrestrial plants depend on. And they don't swim around. These guys are pretty much stationary unless you know, there's ocean currents or river currents. And let me say they exist in pretty much every body of water that exists on our planet. And those are some pictures of what various different types of phytoplankton look like. Now, they also can cause problems because we can get big blooms of phytoplankton or algae and they can result in a disgusting mess. You can kill off fish, it, can, it smells really bad, it can be poisonous to you. And let me say, I've been trying for probably about a year now to come up with a really good explanation of why it is that all algae are plankton but not all plankton are algae. Maybe some of my biology colleagues can finally get me a short sentence on why that's so. But we're not going to hold our breath for that today, but it's true. So how does this relate to ecology? So if Darwin's theory of evolution, it says that basically um, it, 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 the idea is that every species has to fit into a niche. So if every species basically has to be the best at whatever in particular thing it is that that species does, then the number of niches that we have are limited by the number of resources that we have. So plants and phytoplankton, there are three primary resources. But how many species are there? There are an awful lot. How can this be? So the question, one of the questions that I'm asking is, can mathematical modeling help explain why it is that we see such an abundance of life, even though the actual number of resources that we're depending on is actually quite small. So phytoplankton are nice for this. Well, one, you can grow them in these tubes called chemostats. And what you have is you have some kind of nutrients coming in. This is a mixing chamber, so it keeps everything well mixed. You have waste going out, and also some, all your phytoplankton will go out as well. You can measure from the amount of liquid, you, you can measure from what's in there exactly how much phytoplankton and things like that that you've got in there so you can know exactly what's going on, especially if you know what you're putting in and you know what's coming out. You can make a differential equation model for this, very similar to what I was looking at earlier. And so you can very much, you can, you can, you can verify that these equations are correct. So the P's in this case are population densities for phytoplankton. And note that that top equation just says the change in population with time depends on a growth of phytoplankton minus that funny V-shaped thing. That says that's the flushing rate. That's the rate at which water is going through the system. And then nutrients, well, that funny V-shaped thing, that guy says, okay, that's my flushing rate. That depends on what comes in versus what comes out. And then this last term is saying, hey, phytoplankton, when they're creating new ones, they require these nutrients to grow, so they're going to pull nutrients out of the water. Then those two equations are linked by this bottom one. And this bottom one says that, hey, the actual growth rate depends on the maximum growth rate, but then it's modified by the amount of nutrient that I have in the system. And for my students, my math students right at the front, this guy is called a half-saturation coefficient. Can you tell me why? I'm not going to quiz you on this. So let's imagine that n is equal to this k, right? If n is equal to this k, I have k over k plus k. What's that going to be equal to, guys? 
That would be a half. <laughs> so this is called a half saturation because it tells us when the growth rate is a half of its maximum. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Okay, I'm geeking out here. So a lot of some of the work that I've, I've taught this model in class, and I've also worked on it with some summer REU students at Texas A&M. This young lady worked on it in the middle of a mathematical modeling class. Um, my mathematical modeling class used to have pizza and presentations during finals period. These two were not young ladies were not able to make it, so we went out to lunch separately. I was proud, of, very proud of both of them for some for two different reasons, and I was glad we got to do that. All right, so one thing that happens, you can look at how the resources affect the species. So here I've got three species in competition for one resource. And this is kind of cool because you can see how these parameters, how these growth rates, that's a maximum growth rate, and this half saturation coefficient affect things. So what happens here? Well, the green curve shoots up and then it dies off. So it shoots up because this growth rate is the highest. But then it dies off because its half saturation value is the highest. So its growth rate jumps to half when I'm at, at a nutrient value of two and a half. Whereas this guy is not going to get to half his growth rate until his nutrient concentration is much lower. Now the, the blue curve, notice that that's the second highest maximum growth rate. So this guy is beginning, so the green one is, is depleted our nutrients, but that gives the blue one a chance to get to bloom and get larger. And he does for a while, he's all happy, except then he too begins to deplete the nutrients in the system. And that's where this red curve with its lowly old growth rate of only 1.0 that's so much smaller than the other says, my turn, guys. Since he's able to exist with much fewer nutrients than the other two, he grows and persists while these other two die off. Very interesting. So we can look at some mathematics for that. This is one of the equations that we looked at. This relates the actual growth to the maximum growth and the amount of nutrient. The nutrient is represented by S here. So when there's a lot of S, basically, if S is really big and KS then is smaller, if we've got a lot of nutrients, we get the maximum growth rate. When resource limitation occurs, if a species survives, the number of species, this would be the number of, of, of phytoplankton we've got, that can't be zero. So its change will go to zero, it will level off, but the value of n won't be zero. So that tells me that its growth rate has to equal this flushing rate. Okay? So then I can plug that in to that equation, and I can solve for the amount of nutrient that I've got for that. Okay, so if I do that, I find a number of interesting things. So in this graph, I have two species, one and two, and two nutrients. This is the first resource, this is the second resource. And then this graph tells me what's required. So this says that species one requires at least about 0.5 of resource two in order to survive. Species 1, however, only requires about 0.2 of resource 1 in order to survive. Species 2, over here, requires at least 0.7, roughly, of resource 1, but then only requires about 0.2 of resource 2. Then this graph ends up telling me exactly what will happen. So if I'm outside these solid black lines, I don't have enough resources, and both species die off. If I am inside this square area for one, at least right up there, one will win. One wins here because there aren't enough resources for two to exist at all. Two just dies off. In this area, there is enough for one and for two, but one basically beats two here. Likewise, in here, there's not enough nutrients for one. There's not enough, in particular, of resource two for species one, so two just flat out wins. And here, two is able to outcompete one for resource two because two can exist with a lot less than one can. 
And then there's this area in the middle. In the middle, it turns out that I can have both species exist. So it turns out that by running these models, that given however many resources I have, that determines exactly how many species I can have. Which is exactly Darwin's niche theory, right? One has got to be the better, you know, better competitor for a given resource. But again, that's not what we see in real life. So how can we explain this? Well, let me say that this is a laboratory model, right? It has to do with how we do things in the lab. Real life is far more complicated. There are more things to take into account. Our models become more complicated. That certainly is one factor that's true, the real world and mathematical model. You are never going to have a mathematical model that takes into account all of the complexity of the real world. The real world is really complex. But on the flip side, there are other things that we can look at that might give us some hints and insights. And one of these is the idea of a meta community. So in reality, so, so what I was looking at was a chemostat, one thing, nutrients coming in, effluents coming out. In reality, we are often bodies of water, there are a bunch of bodies of water, and they're connected by rivers and streams and things like that. So these are called meta-communities. Each one of these puddle-like things is its own community, but then the whole system of them is the meta-community, is the bigger community. So we've got Apache and ecosystem that's interconnected, and notice that when water flows from one to another, it can carry nutrients, but it also can carry species, so it can take life forms from one place to another. And so the big question is how are meta communities and setups like this connected to species diversity? Can they help us start to explain the mechanisms by which we end up with more species than the number of resources seems to say that we should have? And I've done some initial work with my REU students, and I've done some further work since then in, Bob, in building some of these models. Um, so right now, I'm looking at models that are represented by diagrams like this. This is fairly small. These involve nine patches of water. And you can see from the arrows the way that you have rivers or streams connecting things through them. And so the question is, can I see, by running this with various species and various nutrients, can I see more species diversity than I might expect otherwise? Now this model gets pretty complicated pretty fast. If I had three species and three nutrients, then for each one of these patches, I have to have three species and three nutrients. So this would be six differential equations for the first patch, I need six more for the second patch, and then six more for the third patch. So I need six times nine. Six times nine, that's 54 for the entire thing. A lot of differential equations. And if I go to bigger systems, then I need even more. So this is certainly not easy. So this is something that I'm working on right now. Um, and another interesting thing that's going on in my life is that I, I'm actually working with the senior design team at Central Washington University, not with this model yet, but with the simpler model, with this model, and with some of these graphs, to take this and take some code that I have in a program called MATLAB and put it into Python, and make it perhaps available on the web, so that even people who are a little bit scared of mathematics and who wouldn't want to write computer code to do this sort of thing on their own could nonetheless do experiments based on what we've put together. So those are some of the projects that I've got going on. Um, let me say that I would also love to do more work with disease modeling and things like that. And one thing I'm really looking forward to, this is just my first year at Central Washington, is finding some, somebody out there who wants a mathematician to work with them so that I can do some work on something here with some other faculty and, in fact, students here. I showed some pictures of students earlier, and that's because really one of the greatest pleasures of my last few years has been working with students. So if you're a student looking for a project, let's talk and see if we can find something. 
So that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm also very grateful to the various people who have worked with me.